Unit 15, Patient Safety and Positioning. So this is a, we go over this quickly because most of this is going to be done hands-on in your skills lab. Uh, but use of physical restraints. So in the past, restraints were often used routinely as a preventative measure to avoid falls. Although what's been found recently through research is that it doesn't accomplish this purpose. So what happens is, um, as CNAs, we try to raise the side rail to keep our patients safe, to keep them from, from getting out of bed. But what happens is this confused patient then tries to crawl up over the side rails and gets tangled in the side rails, gets tangled in the bed, and so the falls are actually worse. So rem restraints, um, can be used and they may be used for other preventative measures, but it's really not to avoid falls for the most part. So there's alternatives to the use of restraints, and really restraints are only used as a last resort in situations when the patient may harm self or others. So I'll say that again, only as a last resort, okay? So you have to get approval from the physician for using these, and you have to make sure that you've tried every other means to keep the patient safe and to keep them from harming themselves or others. So they may be used in a situation where somebody's um, confused and they're trying to pull out their catheter to tubing or something where they may be harming themselves, but there's real strict guidelines on using restraints and, and making sure that when they are used, they're used appropriately and that you're checking for circulation, you're checking for skin breakdown underneath the restraints. So they're really, really uh, much more strict guidelines than there used to be. So the purpose of restraints really is to restrict freedom and access to the body. So again, if somebody's trying to pull out their catheter tubing or pulling out their IV or something where it may harm themselves, then they may be used. Uh, so nurse aides can take many actions first to help reduce the need for restraints. So there's a lot of ways you can help reduce the need for restraints. So you know, a lot of times what happens is um, patients are really just pulling on it because they're confused. So you know, checking on that, making sure that the, the catheter tubing's not kinked, it's not creating pressure on their bladder. So just being really mindful and aware of your patients and what may be causing them uh, concern. So potential for side rail injury. So what happens a lot of times is that mattresses may need to be replaced. So they, they get replaced, but they're not the same size as the original mattress. So they're a little bit smaller. And so we'll look at kind of what this does in terms of potential for injury. So there's gaps between the mattress and the bed frame or rail. So again, the, a smaller size mattress, so fitting on the same bed frame, causes a little bit of gaps between the bed frame and rails. And so it can be caused by movement or compression of mattress, or it can just be caused by a, a mattress that's being used that's too small. So if it's if it's wide enough to entrap a patient's head or body, you make sure that you always report up the chain of command. So again, that would be your nurse. So we'll look at these photos here. So these are just different entrapment zones. So just being kind of aware of, especially if it if it has been a replaced mattress or if the mattress has been used for a while and it's been compressed or the patient's positioning is, is kind of causing a gap in the mattress. So additional zones, so there's actually seven zones of entrapment. So these are all in your textbook as well. The most important thing to remember is just the potential for injury, the potential for someone's um, body parts head to be trapped in any of these different zones. And again, notifying the nurse as soon as you identify one of these concerns. So there may be other incidents that can harm the patient. So um, incidents can be prevented if all staff members are aware of appropriate preventative measures. And we'll talk about this in greater detail in class as well. Uh, falls are a really, really big issue in um, healthcare facilities. And so we're going to talk about not only prevention for falls, but kind of follow up and what we need to be watching for with um, at-risk patients. So other incidents that can be um, potential problems for our patients, so accidental poisoning. So there are cases of this, especially if you're working in home health or something um, in, in a facility where you may have confused patients, dementia patients. So um, making sure there's locks that they, on cupboards make, where there's, you know, potential poisonous materials or making sure that they're locked on a top shelf is ideal. So thermal injuries, so burns, so making sure that the, any risk factors for that are taken care of. Skin injuries, so again, you know, especially as folks age, uh, it's there are more risk for skin injuries. So, you know, a, a skin tear can happen really, really easily. So just being aware of that and then choking hazards. 
So uh, caring for patients safely, we must faithfully and carefully carry out specific routines. And this has a lot to do with neglect that we've talked about in other units, but it's really important that when you are working, um, that you follow your policies and procedures of your facility. Because what happens is if something happens to somebody, if you didn't specifically carry out the routines, specifically follow the policy and procedure, and someone is injured, you can be uh, liable for neglect. So procedure is the normal normal manner of carrying out a task. So there is a policy and procedure manual on every floor, so make sure that you've looked at that and you're aware of what the normal manner of carrying out a task is, especially in the beginning when you're a new CNA. So body mechanics, this is really, really important It's the, it, for the patient. So similar to those that we've talked about for the healthcare team, for you as the healthcare provider. Um, so although the patient probably will not be doing any lifting, you should not neglect good posture habits. And we'll talk about this in Skills Lab as well. Even things as simple as feeding and making sure that when you're feeding the patient, you're facing them directly so they're not turning their head, they're not making, they're not having their body out of good alignment. You wouldn't be eating um, with your head cocked to the side the entire time. So just being kind of mindful of what good body mechanics are for the patient and then especially for things like positioning on side that you want to make sure that you're propping the you know the parts where there's bony prominences that could be potentially on top of each other so at the ankles at the knees um, at, you know making sure the arms aren't pinned underneath their body so just making sure that they have really good body mechanics so body alignment and positioning. So maintaining the patient in a position in which the body can properly function. So again, we talked about that in terms of feeding, but also in terms of, you know, another skill positioning on side, just making sure that their body is in good alignment, that their, you know, that their um, back is being propped by a pillow, that their alignment or that their bones aren't being placed on top of each other to make sure that we're, their body can properly function, but also we're not putting them at risk for skin breakdown. So complications um, can occur when the, that body alignment's not maintained or when the patient's position's not changed often enough. And in a future chapter, we'll talk in depth about pressure ulcers. But again, if um, the, the biggest issue with pressure ulcers is pressure on an area where there's a bony prominence. So making sure that we're always or repositioning and that we're always padding those areas. But more importantly is that the patient's positioned, repositioned every two hours or more so if necessary. So there's four positions, and each with variations, and you'll have even more positions listed in your textbook, so make sure that you're aware of what this is. So um, the, four of the basic ones, so prone, supine, lateral, and fowlers. And again, with fowlers, there's also, so that's what you you'd kind of traditionally see in a hospital where someone's sitting um, the, their back is upright and there's different positions. High Fowler's is obviously um, more 75 to 90 degrees all the way up, whereas Semi Fowler's is going to be a little bit lower than that. Lateral is going to be side lying position. Um, supine is going to be laying on their back and prone is going to be laying on their abdomen. So positioning the patient, so after turning and moving the patient into proper body alignment, you're going to use props and other supportive device, devices to help maintain position. So again, the one that you do in, along their back is going to help hold them on their side there. You're going to make sure that there's props between the bony prominences and that there's one positioning on their arm, their arm not being um, pinned underneath them. And that'll make a lot more sense when we practice it in skills lab. So chair positioning, so again, you know, people who are in wheelchairs or who are in that position, they're at risk for pressure ulcers as well. So again, uh, especially in their um, coccyx sacral area, so near their lower back, because of that gravity pushing on that area all the time. So um, it's really important that they're positioned appropriately. So positioning begins with the feet. They should be supported on the floor or the wheelchair footrests, and we'll do this when we do transfer to wheelchair. And ideally, the patient is going to be in a 90-90-90 position. While sitting in the chair and this is referring to the angles of their body when they're in correct position so there should be a 90 degree angle at their hips a 90 degree angles at their um, knees and a 90 degree angle at their ankles and we'll talk about this as well in class where you can kind of see what this looks like and again that's proper body alignment um, in those correct positions 
So remember that repositioning and pressure relief are needed when the patient is in the chair. So if they're able to relieve the pressure themselves, if they're able to use their upper body to shift and reposition themselves, our job as CNAs is just to encourage them to do so. If they're not able to, our job is to make sure that we're repositioning them frequently. So this is a great photo of the 90 degree angle that we're looking for. So again, 90 degrees sort of at their hips, between their upper body and lower body, 90 at the, the knees, and 90 at the ankles. So chair positioning, so refer to the file entitled Pre-Post Procedure. It's, it talks about the beginning procedure actions and procedure completion actions.